And I'm here to tell you marriages are breaking up and churches are breaking up and fellowship groups are breaking up and prayer partnerships are breaking up over petty things where people are not mature enough to say, when it's all said and done, I need you. Welcome to Enduring Truth, teaching ministry of Pastor Paul Shepard. Have you ever allowed petty differences to interfere with relationships? Today in Enduring Truth, we'll discover that we need to put aside such differences and focus on our common bonds through Jesus Christ. We're about to be encouraged by Part 5 from the series Kingdom First Living Volume 1. It's based on Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 33. And now here's Pastor Paul. You will run into people who inadvertently disrespect you or inadvertently cause you to feel bad. In this case, here is Hannah. Now get the context. She and her family have taken their annual pilgrimage to Shiloh where the sacrifice is to be offered. And she spends this time in the temple. The priest is sitting there. Eli is his name. And she goes into the house of God. And the Bible says we know that she's been weeping and she's been pouring out her heart before the Lord. And at this point, she is down to a whisper that cannot be heard if you are in the room. She is, in fact, her mouth is moving, the text says, but you can't hear what she is saying. Now, Eli looks over at her, and Eli, the text says, thinks she is drunk. Why does he think that? Because in his world, from his perspective, that is the only reason why a person would be muttering to him or herself. She looks to him to be someone who is under the influence of wine. And you've seen folk have a conversation with themselves under the influence. You've seen those kinds of things. So Eli assumed that she was drunk. Now it says he thought she was drunk. Nothing wrong with what you think. What you think is what you think. But then he speaks up on the presumption that she is in fact drunk. What he could have done is said, "Uh, pardon me, but uh, have you had some wine today? That way he could have gotten some information. But what does he do? He looks at her, he thinks she is drunk, so he then assumes that what he thinks is so. Have you ever run into folk who look at you and based on what they think they see, they reach conclusions that are not so good and they then begin to operate on those assumptions. They began to talk to others about you based on their assumptions. I know people who have a degree in being presumptuous. I know people who can presume they are so arrogant in their own mind until they don't have to have proof of anything just because they think it, it must be so. I'm a priest before it's over. There are some people who decide they know what is going on in your life based solely on what they think they perceive. And when you are one of those people, not you, but there's somebody on your row I'm talking to. When you are one of those people, you live in this world in a way that disrespects and dishonors the integrity of others because you set yourself up. When you are presumptuous, when you presume to know what people are doing and why they're doing it, what they're thinking and what's really in their hearts, sometimes I've known people who have presumed that they have a whole history of thoughts and ideas and concepts, none of which are substantiated by facts. But that doesn't prevent them from thinking it's so. And so when you are that kind of person, you are bound to go around this world disrespecting other people because you set yourself up in your own heart to be their prosecutor, to be the jury, and to be the judge. When you don't look for facts, you set the case based on what you think, and because you're the jury, you buy the case that the prosecutor, who is you, set up. (laughs) 
So I make the case about you. I take it to the jury, which is me. And is that person guilty? Yes. Then I take it to the judge, who is me. What's the sentence? They are not right. (laughs) And Eli, bless his heart, though a man of God, though anointed and appointed by God, gets into presumption. So he thinks she's drunk. No crime in thinking what you think. But there is a way to handle everything in the kingdom of God. And presumption has no place in the kingdom of God. I know folk who think they have the gift of the word knowledge and all they have is fleshly presumption. And so what he could have done is handled it right. Go and do some fact finding and ask her, by any chance, have you had something to drink? If she had, there's an opportunity for him to minister to her or to admonish her as he goes on and does based on his presumption. But now at least he has facts by which he is operating. No, here's what he does. He thinks she's drunk and then he says to her, watch the way he talks to this precious woman of God. He says, how long will you keep on getting drunk? Not only are you drunk, but you are a regular drunk. In fact, last time you came up here, looked like to me you were drunk. How long will you keep on? He presumes that this is a pattern in this woman's life. How long will you continue to get drunk? And then he says, get rid of your wine. And I'm here to tell you, sometimes the enemy will try to trip you up and get you to lose your focus on going hard after God because you feel so offended and disrespected by some people who are well-intentioned but still wrong as they deal with you. And I'm here to tell somebody that you got to go so hard after God until you got to get to a place where you're not busy picking fights with other folk. I'm here to tell you that you need all the support and all the prayer that you can get. You can't afford to take the well-intentioned people in your life and begin to set them aside and break fellowship and relationship with them so that you end up being isolated and unto yourself. The enemy loves to isolate us because he knows when you're walking by yourself, you can get ambushed. Don't believe me, read Ecclesiastes chapter 4. There's a verse in there that tells you when you are walking by yourself, you are prey for the enemy. But when you have a companion walking with you, the enemy has to think twice before he attacks you. He knows the power of agreement. He knows the power of unity. He knows the power of somebody having your back. And so what he does is he'll take the good intentions of people and he will take their fleshly tendency to reach premature conclusions. And the goal will be to cause you to be so offended until you begin to disfellowship all the folk in your life who God has brought into your life to be a blessing. I'm here to tell you that some of the people who are getting on your nerves, not all of them are your enemies. Some of them are people God has brought into your life, but you just have to learn how to navigate. You do have your enemy. She did have her Peninnas. Now, Peninna was a show enough enemy. And you got to learn how to forgive your enemies and put them in the hands of the Lord. That's the last message. But now I'm talking about what do you do with the folk in your life who aren't enemies, who do mean you well, but they're still getting on your nerves. <laughs> And the answer is you have to learn to navigate. How many know building good relationships is not easy? It's work. It takes work to build solid relationships. It takes work to work through those challenges and difficulties. It takes work to be big enough to work through some of these things. But some of us are so quick to be offended until your first tendency is to take flight and say, I don't need you. I'm already going through enough in my life. And now here you come calling somebody drunk. I 
don't need anybody in my life who can't support me and affirm me and build me up and make me feel special about myself. I don't need you bringing hell every time I look at you. And I'm here to tell you marriages are breaking up and churches are breaking up and fellowship groups are breaking up and prayer partnerships are breaking up over petty things where people are not mature enough to say, when it's all said and done, I need you. I need you. So let's work this out and work this through. I applaud Hannah because Hannah could have been like some of us would have been. Come on, let's be honest and take a look at this situation now. Now get the dynamics. She's already going through hell. She is experiencing this emptiness and frustration of wanting a child and God has closed her womb. Then she's dealing with an antagonist who lives in their home named Penina, who is getting pregnant every time she turned around. <laughs> Penina walked past Elkanah and get pregnant. <laughs> Come on, you know how you're feeling now. You're already empty and frustrated. Then there's somebody in your inner circle who look like they're getting blessed coming and going. See the psychological position she's in? And so she has got some things that she is dealing with. And now here is a well-intentioned man of God who she needs to go before God on her behalf. Remember, this is the old covenant. She can make her personal petition before the Lord, but she has no right to believe that on her own basis she can get her prayers through. She needs the support of those that God has raised up. And here is the very man whose support she needs, being presumptuous and calling her a drunk, a regular drunk. Now you know, if you're going through all of that, and you show up at church, and Pastor Paul looks at you and decides you are drunk or you're on drugs or there's something wrong with your Christian life. And instead of finding the facts, I get presumptuous, assume that I know what's going on, and I then come at you in an attack mode to tell you, well-intentioned, I'm trying to get you to live right now, but I am presuming that there's something wrong. You know what some of y'all would do. <laughs> Pastor nothing. You don't care about a title at this point. <laughs> I don't even care about a baby right now. I got something to deal with here. <laughs> now wait just one minute. Some of y'all, your hand would start bouncing around. <laughs> now wait just one minute. First of all, you don't know anything about me. <laughs> I come up here once a year. You don't know anything about me. <laughs> Sixty-four days a year, you don't even lay eyes on me. I come up here with my family being a devout person and come to the place where God is dwelling and where we are to sacrifice to the Lord. And I walk into a place where a man who called himself a man of God. You know when folk are teeing off on you, you go from a statement to a question. <laughs> Call yourself a man of God. And I come up here, and of all the places in the world, look like to me when you come to the house of God, that's the one place where folk ought to know how to treat somebody. And here I come in this very place where I'm so, I expect it out there in the world, I expect people to mistreat me and disrespect me. But when I come up in here, the last thing I need you doing is talking about me without even knowing what you're talking about. You need to go somewhere. I don't care what degrees you already have. You need to take another course in how to take care of people. <laughs> you need to learn how to treat people right. How to talk to folk. Oh, I know you're on the radio, but you need to talk to people right. <laughs> you know when some of y'all would have got through with me, I'd have had to check my wallet to see what my name was. <laughs> Here's the problem. When disrespect begets disrespect, you don't realize it, 
You feel better when you tee off on somebody, but now you have separated fellowship from people you actually need in your life. And we've got to understand this dynamic because it's happening in so many ways in our experience as people of God. And the fact of the matter is we have got to learn to be big enough to do what Hannah does. Now look at the way this woman handles it. She has been called a regular drunk. He doesn't mean to disrespect her. He just assumed that that's what this muttering to herself indicates. And so he's trying to admonish her by the word of God. But he has made an assumption. Based on the assumption, he has inadvertently caused her to be disrespected. But I love her example. She knows that she's after God and she doesn't have time to get into pettiness. So look at what she says. She says, not so, my Lord. My Lord is that term of respect that often women of her day would give first to their husband, but also to men of God and to persons of stature, persons who held a position of prominence. It was a way of recognizing their prominence. We don't have much of that these days. Folks, just everybody, we all, the world is flat. And not a whole lot of that going on. And we grew up in days where if they were older than you, you spoke with a certain respect. And if they were old enough to be your parent, you treated them like it was your parent. I'm talking about when we grew up. These days, it's just every man for himself, God for us all. I have little kids pushing up on me, telling me, hey, Paul. It's just the way they raise. They don't mean any harm. I mean, I have to dig myself for a minute, but you know. Because I have a flashback. If I had walked up on an adult when I was a preteen child, if I had walked up on, you know, Sister Helen Williams and said, yo, Helen. First of all, she would have straightened me out on the spot. Then if there was somebody who my mama knew (laughs) within earshot, They'd have said, Sister Peggy, you need to have a talk with your son. And they'd have told her, and time I got home, there'd have been a situation. (laughs) But I know this is a different day, and so we adults have to just get ready, because the children will just act like you're one of their boys. Just one of their friends or something like that. So you just got to learn to deal with it. Do like I do. Just scratch even when you're not itching. Just, just. (laughs) She gives the man respect. She says, not so, my Lord. Not so, my Lord. And then she goes to correct him. To enlighten him. Because her goal is unity. I'm before God. And I can't alienate people in my life. I need them to help me get to God. So let me straighten out this well-intentioned, ignorant preacher. (laughs) She says, not so, my Lord. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. She's explaining her behavior. I have not been drinking wine or beer. She want to clear the whole thing. Not only am I not on wine, but I want to make sure you know I haven't been drinking at all. I didn't bring a 40 up here. (laughs) I didn't bring Michelob. I didn't bring Coors. I didn't bring Bud, Bud Light. I didn't bring a wine cooler. I want you to know I have not been drinking. She says, do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. You see the work she is doing to keep not only her heart right, but to keep him Feeling like I need you. And so you have assumed some things that are not right. But rather than attack you out of my frustration, I'm going to do the extra work of enlightening you. So that when we get through talking, we are reconciled. 
Now, I've come to tell you that there is a trend in today's church that has got to change. Because there are a lot of people who, when we get into these kinds of situations of misunderstandings, there is this pattern in our world of disposable things, and we have decided that there are people who are disposable. And I'm here to tell you that when God is at work in your life, you can't go around throwing folk out of your life. When God is at work in your life, you've got to learn to reconcile godly relationships. So much so that the Bible says God doesn't even want to hear your praise and worship when you are disinterested and reconciling with your brothers and sisters. Is there someone you've tossed out of your life over an issue that could be reconciled? As we just heard from our teacher, Pastor Paul Shepard, here on Enduring Truth, we need to be careful in our relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ, lest we allow an offense to sever the relationship and keep us from being blessed by God. Friends, we're being challenged by Part 5 from the series Kingdom First Living, Volume 1. It's based on the Gospel of Matthew, Chapter 6, Verses 31-33. through 33. We'll continue with more tomorrow on Enduring Truth, but first... Here's the number to call to make this essential six-CD series a part of your personal Christian resource library. It's 1-877-958-7884. Kingdom First Living Volume 1 is yours for just $34, and that includes shipping and handling. Again, the phone number, 1-877-958-7884. You can also contact us through the mail, as well as by way of our website at EnduringTruth.org. I'll have more on that for you in just a moment. But first, here's Pastor Paul with some final thoughts. One of the reasons why God has raised up the ministry of enduring truth is to help the body of Christ to understand that God only has one church. Everyone who is born again and who really knows Christ as Savior and Lord of their lives is a member of the one family of God. Denominations were man's idea, not God. The fact of the matter is, when we get to heaven, we will be there by virtue of the grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ that has atoned for our sins. We will not be there because of our denominational affiliation or because of anything else that is human in nature. And for that reason, I'm constantly challenging the body of Christ to understand that we must walk together and we must work together to accomplish the will of God. And I have a booklet entitled, Can't We All Just Get Along, that we wrote some time ago to just encourage people with this information. If you have never gotten in touch with us here at Enduring Truth, I want to invite you to get in touch and to let us know that you're part of our listening audience. And if you'll do that this month, I want to send you absolutely free of charge my booklet entitled, Can't We All Just Get Along? I'm sure it'll be encouraging to you. And so if you've never taken the time to get in touch with us, please do so right now. I look forward to hearing from you. And of course, I hope you're going to join us for our next broadcast. Now, here's how you can reach out to us at Enduring Truth. First, there's our mailing address. It's Post Office Box 52160. Palo Alto, California, 94303. Another excellent way to make contact is through the web at EnduringTruth.org. And don't forget, we always look forward to your letters and emails testifying how God is using this radio ministry to impact your life. Again, our home on the web is EnduringTruth.org. Of course, there's also our toll-free telephone number where a representative is standing by to speak with you right now at 1-877-958-7884. Now, coming up next time on Enduring Truth. God's will is when people have offended you, when there is something separating brother or sister in Christ, you have got to have enough grace to go get it straight. And that takes work. Pastor Paul will challenge us to work on broken relationships as we continue Kingdom First Living. Look forward to you joining us for that. This broadcast has been sponsored by Enduring Truth Ministries and the faithful partnership of listeners in your area. For Pastor Paul Shepherd and all of us at Enduring Truth, remember the truth of the Lord endures forever.